Hello, everybody. Welcome to this afternoon's session. Uh, I will be your host. I am Dr. Tom Crawford. I'm a maths tutor uh, here at the University of Oxford. I'm based at St. Edmund Hall, which is one of the colleges at the university. If you're into your YouTube maths, you may also recognize me uh, from my own channel, Tom Rocks Maths, and also Numberphile, which is the best maths channel on the internet, let's be honest. Um, so uh, today uh, we are going to be talking about the big question, do we see colour the same? And we're going to be approaching this with all kinds of interesting insights uh, from our panel of academics at the university, uh, myself included. Um, we have lots of interactive activities uh, that we'll be sharing with you in the first half of the session to get you thinking about the question in different ways. So I'll be looking at a color coding, well, setting you a color coding challenge and talking about computers and how they maybe see color. Um, we've also got a uh, animal senses quiz, which I'm really looking forward to, uh, and also an art science investigation. So lots of exciting things. Then in the second half of the session, uh, that will be your opportunity to ask all of us questions. So um, I think you only have the Q&A feature. So hopefully you'll all get this correct. But if you want to send in a question, you have to click on Q&A and send in your question. Uh, and they will then be filtered down to me and I will relay them to, to our panel um, of experts. So let's meet uh, our fantastic panel. So I think Taya, you're gonna go first. You'd like to say hello to our audience. Yeah, hi everyone. I am Dr. Thea Gigo, and I work in the conservation department at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. I am a postdoctoral researcher and my background is in heritage science. And this means that I use science to study and investigate the materials of art and archeological objects here at Ashmolean. Okay, so historical stuff, archaeology, heritage in particular, anything around that kind of aspect uh, to do with colour, send those, send those questions in for, for Taya. Uh, and Tanisha, would you like to say hello? Hi, I'm Tanisha. Um, I'm fortunately or unfortunately American, as you can tell by my accent. Um, I just finished my PhD in the Department of Zoology this past October, where I looked at how badgers use their sense of smell to communicate with each other, especially when they're trying to, you know, find a partner. Um, and right now I'm working in the Mathematical, Physical and Life Sciences Division, where I help various departments, um, like the math department and also zoology with gender equality. So anything to do with animals in short? is going to be send those guys if you want to know about animals that see in cool ways Tanisha is going to be your go-to uh, for those kinds of questions I'm sure um, right now as I mentioned the big question is do we see color the same and something that's really important when you're sort of an academic or you're even a student at, as you progress to, to a higher level such as at university is to actually think a lot when you're asked a question like this rather than immediately coming up with an answer is to critically analyze the question and think a little bit more like about what the question actually means because of course questions can be interpreted in many different ways um, so with this in mind uh Taya what do you sort of think of when you when you hear this this question do we see color the same well the first thing that jumps in my mind is that we really need to think about who is we well, from my perspective, right, because I am investigating at a crossroad of history and science, heritage and science. So we could mean many different things. It could be we nowadays in 2021, or could be someone else that lived in Egypt many, many years ago. So first thing to think about, who is we? Who are we talking about? And I'm guessing, Tanisha, we to you is animals, <laughs> badges in particular, perhaps. You know, like you said, we can be humans versus animals, and then there's different types of animals like insects versus larger animals, um, and also depends on the environment in that marine animals see may see color differently than animals that live in the forest or the desert, and also how are we measuring, you know, this color vision. You know, one way would be looking at the photoreceptors in the eye, so rods and cones, the you know, the cells in your eyes that see color. 
you know, that depends on animals. And you can also do behavioral tests like I've done with badgers where, I mean, I looked at their sense of smell, but you can also test animal vision as well with different behavioral tests. And I think sort of on, on that topic as well, like the interpretation of the question, the fact that it says like the same, like what do we mean by that? Do we sort of, as you were hinting at, Tanisha, do we mean, do, you know, are we saying, do humans see color the same way as a badger, for example? Is that what we're asking here? Or are we just focusing on one particular species? So there's lots, there's definitely a lot of different ways that, that you can interpret this question. Um, and this is a very important skill that, that hopefully you should all in the audience be thinking about as well. Like, how do you interpret the actual wording of the question before you then go on to think about perhaps how you would answer the, the, the question itself? So we're going to now move on to some, some demos, some, some interactive uh, activities for you all to take part in. And please do take part in these um, as much as you can. Um, so... I think I'm going to kick us off, actually, aren't I? And obviously, I'm going to talk about maths. I couldn't resist any opportunity to, to talk about maths. Uh, and what I would like to talk about is actually how colour is interpreted by computers. So we, in this context, is I'm sort of thinking about how do computers see, see colour and interpret um, colour. So I'm going to be writing on my board. I've got my, my chalk ready. So one of the ways that colours are represented um, on a computer. And if you've played around in Photoshop or the more budget version Paint, which I think is now discontinued, which is a very sad day where that happened, but I grew up playing around in Paint. You, when you have a color, or you try and select a custom color, you are sometimes asked to input the RGB value. So you have um, these three numbers, RG and B, in a bracket like this. And what this represents is the amount of red the amount of green and the amount of blue that you want in your color. And then you kind of mash them all together and you end up with purple or white or whatever it is that, that you want. And all colors can be made through combinations of these three. Um, and the scale, um, and some of you may recognize this, goes from zero up to 255. So uh, as a very simple example, if we take white, which is kind of everything at once, white is all colors uh, mixed together, then the uh, RGB value for white is gonna be 200. You want all of the reds, all of the greens, and all of the blues. So the way a computer would see the color white is 255 comma 255 comma 255. Very different, of course, to how we see. The, the color white. So this is one way of representing um, a color through these numbers between 0 to 255. Now in um, web browsers, there is, there's a different code that's actually used to um, tell you which colors are present and to represent these different colors. Um, and it's used, it uses something uh, called base 16. So what this means is you want to write these numbers in terms of how many lots of 16 do you need? So for example, um, uh, this is gonna be a helpful thing to know. 16 times 16 is 256. So this is why we use base 16, and this is why the scale goes from naught to 255. So the way we would represent white in base 16 is gonna be, so 255. So I, I can't take 16 lots of 16. If I did 16 lots of 16, I get 256, which is too big. So all I can do is take 15 lots of 16. But then that's 240. So now I'm 15 short. So what I need to add on is 15 lots of one. And for the more mathematically minded amongst you, the reason we consider numbers of 16 plus the amount of one is because 16 is 16 to the power one, and one is 16 to the power zero. So this is what we mean when we work in base uh, 16. So you just need to know how many 16s do I need and how many lots of one, but the amount you're allowed is between zero and 16, because otherwise you then go to the next step up. So white can be represented as um, 15, 15, would represent 255 in base 16. So we can say in base 16, the number 255 is actually equal to 1515, which is super confusing because we're, you're reading this as like 1515. 
right? Because that's how we, because we work in base 10. But computers, in the context of colors, work in base 16. Um, but so a computer would interpret 1515 15 to know it meant 255 and know that you therefore had those three values for white. Now, to help us get around this, sort of because the fact that humans are the ones programming these things, what we do is actually, as well as using numbers, we use letters. So what I mean by this is we need to be able to represent the numbers all the way through to 16. So eight, nine. Right, so I can't go to 10. Because here, I'm allowed anywhere from zero lots of 16 up to 15 lots. So for zero through to nine, we use the actual numbers. But then we don't want to write 10 because that gets confusing, like a misreading of this. So then we start to use letters. So we represent 10 by A, we represent 11 by B, 12 by C, 13 by D, 14 by E, and then 15 by F. So now I can represent the numbers naught through to 15 through a single uh, character. So what this means really for 255 is this is F. So the web-based color that a computer reads for white is 255, 255, 255, translated into our base 16 secret code becomes FF, FF, FF. So that's another way that a computer reads the color white. It can either read the amount of red, green, and blue and get you a color, or you give it a six digit code which is translated or de deciphered like this into the RGB, and then you turn it back into your color. Now, I'll show you another example, and then I'm gonna ask you to decode some of these for yourselves. Um, so I'll leave up the letters on the side, um, and probably that. So I'm gonna look at the color. What example have I got for you? Let's look at purple. So, purple in RGB values, um, you need a little bit of red. Actually, this is testing like art knowledge, which two colors do you mix together to get purple? So you need a little bit of red. Uh, so it's one, two, eight. You have half of the reds. Then you actually have uh, zero of the greens and you have half of the blues. So that gives you the standard purple color. Obviously you can get different shades of purple by slightly changing these numbers. But this is your standard purple color, again, on, on like something like Photoshop. Um, so now you need to translate this. So the first thing is to write this in base 16. So we need to know how many 16s go into 128, um, which I think is eight. Uh, I'm going to double check that so I don't do this wrong. Yes, it's eight. Eight times 16, exactly. So in base 16, this is equal to um, eight, 128 is eight times 16, and then we don't need anything else. So we don't need any of the ones on the end. So purple therefore is equal to eight, zero, and that perfectly translates as the number eight and the number zero. So the final code for purple is one, two, eight, which is eight, zero. Then we have nothing, which is zero, zero. And then we have eight, zero again. So white was six Fs in a row, purple is eight zero, 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 eight, zero. All right, now um, I'll give you one to work out for yourselves um, and then we better move on. So let's do silver, um, right, and I'll leave this up so you can all see this. So silver um, has RGB code 192, 192, 192. So what I would like you to all think about, and you can do this whilst we're listening to the next uh, mini presentation, though definitely make sure you pay attention. But if for those of you who would like to try this out, try and convert silver, which is 192, 192, 192. I'd like to know which six letter code will the computer read silver? How will a computer interpret silver? So let's now um, move on to uh, Taya. You were going to go next for us, weren't you? And you're going to look at the, this question about um, how do we interpret color from the perspective of a heritage scientist. So I'll pass over to you. 
All right, everyone. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today, as I said already before. Without further ado, because we don't have much time, let's move already into the first slide, please. So, color has bewitched humankind ever since the dawn of time. And different sources of color have been used throughout history for painting, writing, and decorating. In antiquity, colors were extracted mainly from natural sources, such as the deep blue that you can see on this slide, extracted from the mineral lapis lazuli, which was very rare and was traded at a high cost. Another example is the Tyrian purple that Phoenicians started to extract from a particular species of sea snails. Tyrian purple too was very costly because tons of snails had to be sacrificed in order to produce only a few grams of the pigment. Indeed, it is not a case that in Roman times, gowns dyed with Tyrian purple were worn exclusively from members of the upper class. Of course, in producing colors from natural sources, our ancestors were limited by the set of tins Mother Earth provides. However, things started to change after the Industrial Revolution. Next slide, please. So the technological progress led to the creation of many new different colors, thanks to chemical synthesis. To mention just few cases, so a new green color called emerald green was synthesized and introduced on the market in 1814. And a new purple color called mauveine was introduced in 1862. Thanks to the Industrial Revolution, new colors and hues were about available at a cheap cost. And these clearly impact the way humankind started perceiving color. For instance, when I nowadays think about color, I do not depict in my mind only the seven colors of the rainbow or the other colors available in nature, but I actually think of many more tints and shades and hues. Um, think for instance, uh, to, for, for about the last time you went shopping for a green t-shirt. Most likely you saw several. Uh, you might have seen an olive green one, uh, an emerald green one, a pika green one, and I could carry on like this for hours. On a different note, let's change slide, please. I would like to invite you to reflect on the misleading perception of colors we might sometime have when we are contemplating works of art. From the moment it is created, every art piece starts a process of aging. Exactly like human beings, also artworks become old. And the effect of light and of weathering conditions uh, impact the visual appearance of the colors highly. So imagine visiting a museum and contemplating this, this particular artwork. How nostalgic, you might think. It looks so dull, lifeless. Well, this same work of art might appear completely different to a visitor coming after you who had the chance to see the same artwork after it was restored and after the brownish layer of varnish had been removed to reveal the true colors. To conclude this presentation, I would like to share with you the point of view that I, as a heritage scientist, sometimes adopt when I observe color. So on the left, is a Spanish Gothic altarpiece, the way you see it normally in a church. And on the right are two cross sections that were obtained from this altarpiece. So what we did is we used a scalpel, a surgical knife, to collect some painting material from the altarpiece. Then this sample was embedded in a resin and polished to reveal the cross section. So you can actually observe that the painting is made of many different layers. The top layer corresponds to the last color that was applied by the artist. And the bottom white layer corresponds to the ground that was applied as a preparation before starting painting. Let's go on to your challenge. On the left are two of the panels from the altarpiece I showed in the slide before. And on the right are three different cross sections. 
The first thing you have to do is determine which color results from this complex layering of many different pigments. And the second thing you have to do, you have to guess where these samples were extracted from on these two painted panels. Good luck. Thank you very much, Taya. So I'm guessing we will also be revealing the answers um, and discussing those a little bit later once everyone's had a chance to think about it. Um, right, so let's move on to Tanisha before we get around to, to answers the sort of things at the end, I think, is how we'll do this. We're going to be doing an animal quiz about how animals use visual communication, which is obviously seeing things, and olfactory communication, which is their sense of smell. So I'm going to do kind of a rapid fire quiz. Um, so the first question is, Animals use visual, visual signals for many reasons, including to warn off predators. However, which of these colors is not common in warning signals? Is it red, white, green, or black? So which color is not usually found in warning signals? So you have a few seconds to answer this and then- Am I allowed to answer? Huh? Yeah, everyone. Am I allowed to answer? I don't. Um, I I want to say green because green is like go and it's like things are good. Would be my guess. I don't know if anyone else is thinking along these lines. I agree with you, Tom. Well, we'll see if you're right at the end. Okay. So next question: Some animals can see in color better than others. Which of these animals has the most advanced color vision? Is it the African elephant, the mantis shrimp? the orca whale, or the brown bear. So which animal has the most advanced color vision so they can see the most colors? Any ideas from the panel? I know this one, so I'm staying quiet because okay. I know the answer. I don't know, I would think the, the mantis shrimp just because it reminds me of the little mermaid and it was pretty colored down there, so I <laughs> guess. Yeah, that's a good point. And like your, the animal's environment can affect color vision. So for example, with badgers that live underground, they, they scratch, scratches up their eyes, so they can't really, badgers can't really see in color. So next question, sometimes animals use their sense of smell alongside or instead of visual signals, which of these traits can be detected by smell? So is it social group, reproductive status, dominance, health, or all of the above? So what can animals tell just by smelling each other? I think they can definitely dominance reproductive status, probably social group, maybe health. I'm unsure if it's, maybe it's all of the above, <laughs> but, I, but the health, health is perhaps what I've never heard of before, is what I'm thinking. I think it's all, all of the above, definitely. So now we go on to my study animal, the European badger. So European badgers rely a lot on factory communication. So communicating by their sense of smell. Their sense of smell is how many times greater than ours? Is it 100 to 200 times? 400 to 500 times? 500 to 600 times? Or 700 to 800 times greater than humans? I know they have a really good sense of smell. I feel like every animal that isn't a human has a really good sense of smell. Um, so I'm gonna go big. I think it might be the big one if I were to, to have a guess. Okay, so you think 700 to 800 times? Yeah, I think so. I think so, yeah. What about you, Taya? I am really not as good at the numbers as Tom is, I'm sure. So I will go with anything he decides to go with. So I'm just agreeing with him. Okay, so the popular guess is 700 to 800 times better than a human. So green is not a common color in warning signals. So red, white, black, and yellow are the most common warning colors. Um, for the animal that has the best color vision, the mantis shrimp is thought to have the most advanced vision of any animal because they have lots of photoreceptors. For its sense of smell, animals can tell all of the above. So social group, reproductive status, dominance, and health can all be detected by um, sense of smell because of bacteria and hormones and all that gross, smelly stuff. And um, a European badger's sense of smell is thought to be 700 to 800 times greater than a human's sense of smell. And that's because badgers live underground and all of that dirt scratches up their eyes. So, you know, and plus they're nocturnal. So there's no point in being able 
you know, they can just can't really see that well anyways. They can see like shapes and figures, but, but like not really much in color. So how did everyone do? They did well. I'm, I'm seeing it come through here. Mo well, well, I say this, most people went for white, apparently on the warning one. So they didn't listen to me. <laughs> My complete guess. Oh, it was a guess. I was guessing. Um, I was tempted by white, to be fair. I was torn between green and white. Um, but apparently most common was white. Um, most common was the shrimp, which, which I did happen to know. And Taya, you, you did guess that one as well. Um, all of the above. Um, I feel like once you... I think one or two of them, it felt as though there was more than one, which kind of then meant that you had to go for all of the above, I think, is, uh, is sort of how I deduced that one. Uh, and then 700 to 800. So my guess was correct. <laughs> and that's also what everybody seemed to go for as well uh, for that last one. So I think, I think our, our audience did very well. You know, come study theology here. <laughs> uh, right, Taya, I think we're going to go back. Wonderful. Hopefully, I think we do I have think... a slide. We do have a slide there. Yes, we? there is one last slide with the answers. So yes, actually the first sample on the left, it's actually was actually taken from the green vest of this character here. And the only clue to a green pigment was actually this, this particle that you can see there is a number five on top of it. So it was pretty difficult to actually um, uh, guess that one. Um, then you've got this second sample, you see, you can see blue particle and also red particles. So you can imagine it's something some color between like blue and red, some purplish maybe, um, and it was taken from the vest of this other character. And finally, my favorite sample, it was this one, so many different layers. You've got the red, then you've got a golden layer, then you've got a white, and then on top you've got a blue layer. And this was actually taken there at the edge between the red floor and the blue bed with the golden decoration, which explains the reason why we have so many different layers of black in here. So. They were tough, but they were fun. I like it, thank you. Yeah, that was uh, right, and then finally, I guess I got to reveal my answers, haven't I, as well? So, uh, so silver, I think a lot of you, most of you, I think, got the correct answers very well done. If you said uh, the answer is going to be C0, C0, C0. Um, and quite a few of you, I think I saw, also wrote 12, 12, 12. Now, what you've done there is that 192 is indeed equal to 12 times 16. But remember, we need to emphasize that we have zero lots of one. You have to give the zero. So that would be 12 zero would represent 92. So you need to convert 12 to C. So that's why it's C zero, C zero, C zero, rather than um, one, two, zero, one, two, zero, one, two, zero, because you need six. Um, symbols rather than 12. But I think most people did get that, so well done if you figured out what's going on with silver. All right, I think it's time for some questions now. We did promise you in the second half we would answer your questions. Um, so let's just dive straight on in. And remember, you can keep sending these in through the Q&A. Um, they're getting fed through to me on a, on a document here. Um, so we've got one here which has come from an anonymous person, which is for me which asks, um, are hexadecimals used in computing for colors in specific pixelated images? Uh, the answer is yes. So if you have a, um, an Apple computer, there is um, an app called the Digital Color Meter. So if you search, you can find this and then you open it and it's really fun because you just move your mouse around any part of your screen and it gives you the RGB code for any color on that particular pixel on your screen. Uh, so it's very fun. It's used a lot by designers and creative people who work on Photoshop, for example, because you can immediately just sort of like it's called the eyedropper tool as well. You can immediately see what the color is and then you just type in either the RGB code or the hexadecimal six character code. And then you can use that color in your in your work when you're on Photoshop or, or other similar um, software. So, yeah, it is. You can literally take any image and you can your computer will tell you. The, the required either RGB or the hexadecimal code. And both of them are used. It very much depends on um, what, what you're doing really. So like I've used both on different projects in the past. So I've been told, use this color, here's the RGB code. And I've been told, use this color, here's the hexadecimal code. Um, so I don't think there's necessarily a standard way of doing it, which is why I represented both of them uh, when I was talking about that. Okay, um, let's see what we've got here. Um, I've got a question 
here. Oh, this is a good one from uh, Shukab. Apologies if I'm saying that wrong, uh, but thank you for your question, uh, which I think is aimed at Tanisha. It's about animals. How does an animal recognize a color from its sense of smell? See, I think it could be possible. So like in the brain, there's different like nerves that affect like your sense of smell and your sense of vision. And so also animals can learn. There's a whole field about like animal cognition, which is how animals think and learn. And so animals could, you know, theoretically learn like, oh, this is, you know, a, you know, a plant because, or this is a pear because this smells like a pear or something like that. Um, and that's also really useful for certain animals. Like, you know, we were talking about the, you know, how certain colors are used as warning signals and green is usually used as a signal for being an animal being poisonous. So usually animals can like learn by trial and error, unfortunately, mm. like, oh, this, I shouldn't eat this frog because it's green. And if I eat it, I'll get really sick and die. I was just going to say, I certainly think that I would associate certain smells with certain colors. So like an obvious one being like the smell of freshly cut grass. I'm immediately like picturing green, probably because of grass. Um, and like salt water, like being by the sea and smelling the sea air makes me think of blue. Oh yeah, that's like associations with smell and that's a, a whole other thing. So if you want to work in the perfume industry, like <laughs> like a database about like, oh, people associate this smell with masculinity or whatever. Thank you. Um, Tay, I've got a good one for you here. It's coming from Mazen M. Can you describe how humans say 1000 years ago would see color would it differ from how humans see it today? Historically, there have been colors that have been favor favored over others. And for example, the color, the color violet in painting was barely ever used until up to the end of the 19th century. And so actually researchers are now trying to figure out why this was the case. And among the possible answers, they even uh, consider the fact that it might have been something might have seen a uh, change, sorry, in our way of perceiving color and particularly in our way of perceiving the blue wavelengths that are of course connected to mm. violet. So Tanisha, actually, I think we, we touched on this a little bit in your animal quiz about the, when you mentioned that the shrimp had more receptors in their eyes. So do you maybe want to explain a little bit about how does that work? Because I know that humans have three, three receptors, three cones, is it, or something in their mm -hmm. eyes? So rods are like the parts of your eyes that um, kind of interpret like low wavelength. So, you know, and then cones are for like color vision. So I remember mm -hmm. it as like cones, like ice cream cones, you know, you can put like lots of colorful decorations on it. That's for color receptors. Um, and in terms of like, so like there's lots of ways to test, like, first of all, how many receptors an animal has in their eyes and then seeing like how that would be interpreted by the animal. Um, and like also there's different ways, you know, also there's lots of experiments about how animals look under different light. So um, it was recently discovered that platypus glow green under certain types of light. So, um, you know, so Phineas and Ferb was actually on to something when they made Perry the platypus green. And something that I think you touched on a little bit, um, Taya, in, in, your, in your slides as well, was like sort of the different interpretations of color throughout history um, as well, which, which I find fascinating. So I remember reading something quite, quite um, recently which talked about the change in sort of like male fashion that like now to look smart, you're meant to wear like a dark suit basically. Whereas like a couple of hundred years ago, it was like as big and bold color as you could possibly go was like how you showed off that you were like a smart, well-off kind of like nobleman. It's definitely very interesting to reflect upon. Uh, you know, many things have changed and then there are some things which actually stayed the same like for a very, very long time. For example, our general fascination for the color blue. I'm pretty sure that if I ask now, what's your favorite colors and put it in a chat, probably most people would answer blue. It is kind of connected to our culture because researchers found that actually it is mostly a mostly European centered view that would put color as a, a blue as a favorite color. 
And it's interesting to see that actually this fascination goes back millennia. Blue and a uh, pigment called actually Egyptian blue was the first synthetic color ever produced. So the Egyptians, millennia before Christ, wanted to have a, a blue pigment. They couldn't actually trade lapis lazuli. Lapis lazuli was not traded yet. And so they found a way to make themselves blue by simply just mixing different ingredients and heating them up. So yeah, fascination of, for blue colors, something that kind of never changed. Okay, um, right, thank you. I'm just trying to find another question here. Um, okay, this is an interesting one. It's coming from Isra. Hello, Isra, thank you for your question. Uh, this one's for you, for you, Taya. Um, are there any particular moments in history where incorrect restoration of art has influenced culture or society negatively? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we can name a few. Well, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the restoration of the Sistine Chapel, but that definitely was quite controversial, let's put it that way. When restoration is actually um, a very, very difficult things to, 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 to thing to do, because it's not just about technical execution is also about thinking what are the ethical values we want to, to use and why we operate our restoration intervention. Just for you to think about a big topic here. Imagine that you have an original uh, painting by, Le by Leonardo that was then in the second moment touched up by another famous artist. As a restorer, what would you do? Would you leave, would you just clean up all the second beat that was done by the second artist, although he was famous as well, and then go back to the original piece that Leonardo made? Or would you leave this second layer on top of the painting as kind of a witness of the history of the, of the painting itself? So this is the reason why restoration can be very controversial is precisely because it brings up very important ethical issues and it's very difficult to actually find protocols. We cannot operate always following the same methodology. We have constantly to face different kinds of questions and to try to find the best possible answer and then to operate. Tanisha, question from Eleanor. Thank you for your question, Eleanor. Uh, do we perceive colors differently to animals because society has conditioned humans to associate emotions with them, whereas for animals, colors are more about survival and reproduction? So in general, like, I think sense of, you know, color vision or good vision in general really depends on an animal's environment. I could also depends on psychology as well, but it's mostly even for humans, it's a matter of survival. Um, and so, for example, humans are more visual creatures. So, you know, because we're carnivores, so we need, you know, good eyesight. And it's the same for other animals that are also at the top of the food chain, like lions or, you know, dogs and cats. They're technically carnivores, so they need good vision. Um, and it's thought that dogs kind of see in slow motion. So that way, cause like if you know, it's like when you throw, you know, a ball for a dog to catch, like they just somehow know exactly where to go, even though the ball's going super fast. So, you know, so that's because it's thought that animals, that dogs can see in slow motion. Um, but yeah, I think like for animals in general, including humans, like we, it is about survival, but also like where you are in the food chain because some animals need really good vision to find their prey. Um, and then some prey kind of learn that and, you know, come up with colors or patterns to kind of blend in. Like with zebras, you know, they're striped. Mm. Like it's not really for camouflage because if you're in the savannah where it's all brown grass and you're black and white stripes, like that's really, really obvious. That's not camouflage. But if you're, if a bunch of zebras are close together, it kind of creates this, you know, huge like pattern that has like no shape or border and so a lion looking at that may think like I can't tell where one zebra ends and where the other one begins and I you know they're just going towards this huge blob and then it's easier for zebras to kind of just you know group together and protect each other and especially protect their young so um so yeah like you know like obviously I think humans we use psychology as a way to um 
you know, manipulate colors as Taya mentioned, like, you know, all of that, but, you know, we use, yeah, I think we use um, color and vision a lot for survival. It's just, we don't really think about it as much because we have more ways to protect ourselves compared to animals. Question from Nidhi. Nidhi, thank you for your question. Uh, to what extent does our language affect how we see or understand color? I wouldn't know how to give you a straightforward answer, but what I can say is that um, when I'm not a native English speaker, and to me, the difference between violet and purple is pretty clear because in my language, in Italian, the difference between viola e, e rossastro is pretty clear. But I learned this year that it's actually not like this in England, and people in England have more issues in actually defining what's purple and what's violet. Now, Tom, I'm pretty sure that you can give us a code for this and just you know <laughs> <laughs> this, topic, yeah. this question once and for all. But in general, there is a lot of confusion in the English culture about purple and violet. And I don't find the same confusion in my language, for example. This one's coming from um, Genty. Again, apologies if I'm butchering your name. Um, does the scientific point of view limit our ability to explore this question at a deeper level? That is a very interesting question, very thought provoking question. So does the scientific point of view limit our ability to explore the question? So I'm guessing here, at least the way I'm thinking about this is, Genty's kind of asking like, because we're thinking about it scientifically in terms of like, can I see, especially me talking about coding and specific numbers and different pixel values, that's like a very scientific approach rather than thinking sort of taking a step back and coming at it. And we've touched on this a little bit about like emotions attached to colors or the changing um, way colors are perceived. Um, I don't know if either of you have any thoughts on that. Like mantis shrimp can, you know, like you mentioned before, they have the most advanced color vision. And so like, so yes, they can see colors that we as humans can't and they can perceive like the tiniest variations. And like we were talking about purple versus violet, they can see like, all the different like tiny changes in that. Um, but I think a lot of times as scientists, we kind of fall into the idea of, well, what's the point? Like you want to know, okay, animals can see colors, but what's the evolutionary advantage of it? Or how does it help rather than just thinking about, oh, well, that's just a cool question to ask. Why let's just see what colors they can see. Um, and part of that's due to like, politics and academia and getting funding and they funding bodies want to know like what's how will this change the course of science but um but yeah I think a lot of times we as scientists like to think well we don't have a really good reason for why we're asking this question then let's not bother asking it. Hey, yeah, anything to add as, as possibly less of a scientist than those two? I hope you don't mind me saying that. <laughs> well um I, I think that um, I don't remember the name of the person asking this question, so sorry if I can't address you personally, but you might be interested in the psychology of color. So there is a whole you know, branch of research which is researching the, the psychology of color, so the, how we connect certain colors to our emotions, for example. Now, it is still kind of uh, following scientific method because all the research, even if it's not research in, in science, in pure science, is still following scientific method. But um, if you're interested more in, in this kind of question, like how are emotional links to color and, and these kind of topics, well, then try to Google psychology of color. Maybe you're going to have a nice time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, right, I think we'd better sum up, you know, um, seeing as we're supposed to come to some kind of answer on the question as to do we see color um, the same so I suppose I, I, I will I will dive in first and attempt to, to answer this question uh, I think the answer is no we do not see color the same um, and there are lots of we haven't even talked about this I meant to bring this up and I forgot until now there was the thing was it like four or five years ago with the the dress is it blue or is it white that was the whole thing circulating online. And obviously that was just people interpreting things differently. So that was a very obvious example of humans, uh, the same species seeing, seeing things differently. Um, but uh, I guess I, 
so, so that's one example specifically with humans. And another way I would think about it is there are so many, again, looking at what I talked about with the, the way that computers would interpret colors, even we've seen here, even within programming, there are two ways of telling a computer how to interpret a color. So clearly, again, like the same thing, interpreting color can be done in very different ways. So, so for me, I think it's a resounding, we do not see color the same. Tanisha, what do you think? What's your sort of concluding remarks after our discussion? Um, I think maybe in the same species, yes. For example, all badgers may see color the same, which is to say not very well. Um, but I mean, there can be similarities within a species, but if we're comparing different species, then no, because we just mentioned like animals can see a vast range of colors because of survival, because of their environment, because it helps them find mates or avoid poisonous things that may kill them. Um, but yeah, I think maybe within a species, yes, but different species, no. Okay. That's good. I like that. That's a good answer. Um, and Taya, finally, what do you think? Yes, my final remark is that I think we should um, think about what, what do we mean by see in the question, do we all see color the same? See could be the biological ability to actually perceive color to see biologically because you do have the receptors. So do we all see the same or not? Well, in this case, it's probably easier to answer this question. And Tanisha just did it right now. And then there is, do we all perceive color the same? And clearly when it comes to history, well, humankind has perceived different colors in different ways, depending on many different factors and culture is one of those. Okay, right, brilliant. Thank you so much to both uh, Teo and Tanisha for being our, our expert panel of academics. Uh, it's been fab, I hope you've had as much fun as I have, and I'm sure as our audience have, uh, discussing this big question today. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, do, if you want to know more about this discussion, we um, actually over on the Oxflor website, which is oxflor.org, there's an entire section of the website devoted to do we see color the same? And you can watch another live stream event, which I also happened to host a few years ago with other academic experts, where we talked all about the same question. So there's there's so much you can dive into with this. And there's lots of other resources there uh, exploring this question. And there are like hundreds of other similar questions. Um, so it's a really good resource if you're looking for that extracurricular stuff um, to sort of you know really dig your teeth into um, outside of your work at school. Um, so again, thank you so much for our panel. Thank you all for joining and uh, we'll see you all very soon. <laughs>